Okay, well, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for being here today, and thank you to Johannes for inviting me. Um, so I am Kristen Jackvoni, and I am here to talk to you about designing an effective mobile automation strategy. So a little bit about me before we get started. Johannes uh, teased some of the things about me. I'm the author of a couple of books, The Complete Software Tester, and also Logical Fallacies for Testers, which just came out last month. I'm the creator of the Monday Morning Automation YouTube show. This is a weekly show that is designed to teach manual testers everything about automation in little five to 10 minute lessons. I'm the author of the LinkedIn Learning Course, Postman Essential Training. I'm a blogger at Think Like a Tester. And then my day job is I'm a principal engineer for software testing at Paylocity. So if any of you have ever done mobile testing, you know that it's a big challenge. Even manual mobile testing is a big challenge because there are more points of failure with a mobile app than there are with a browser. For example, you could be on Wi-Fi or you could be on the network or your device could get a phone call or a text while you're using the app. There's also a much greater variety of devices that the mobile app can run on. Um, and there's different screen sizes. And then of course there's two different OSs, Android or iOS. Um, and then apps are more challenging to create than an HTML website because the tools are always changing. I actually took a, a course in um, Android development with Kotlin, and then all of a sudden I discovered, you know, a year later that there was, now there was uh, Jetpack Compose, which was built on top of Kotlin. So it's always changing. So if you know the challenges of mobile manual testing, then you probably won't be surprised to find out that mobile automated testing is even more challenging. So it's definitely more challenging than web automation. So what we're going to talk about today is I'm going to give you six steps for coming up with a comprehensive mobile automation strategy that will hopefully help you make good decisions and start your project off the right way. So step one, is to determine why you are automating. So why are you automating? This is a question that's important to ask because it's important to set appropriate expectations. You should not just be automating because it's the thing to do. You should have genuine reasons for why you are automating. And it should be a discussion that you have with your team and not a unilateral choice because um, you and your team are going to have to work on this automation together. It's important in any kind of automation, even web automation, that you and your team know how to do it, but that it's even more important when you're doing mobile automation because it's so tricky. So here are some good reasons to automate. One, it will free up testers to do more exploratory testing. And we all know that exploratory testing is the way that all of the really good, clever bugs are found. Also, it will provide developers with the confidence that their changes haven't broken anything. If a developer is working in the middle of the night and they want to push their changes to the build, if there's automated testing, they can find out if they broke something without having to wake up you in the middle of the night and have you manually test it. It also serves as a quality gate to catch bugs before they are deployed. If you've got tests set up for when you do your deployment to production and you see that your tests are failing, you can roll your deployment back. So here are some bad reasons to automate. First of all, to replace software testers. That's a really bad idea because we know software testers are great at finding the important bugs and also because some manual testing is always going to be needed with mobile. There is nothing like a pair of eyes and hands and an actual mobile device to find the bugs. Another bad reason to automate is because automation is more fun than manual testing. I don't particularly find it more fun, but <laughs> there are many people who find automation fun and, and they shouldn't be automating just because they like to do so. There should be some actual reasons for working on the project. Another bad reason is to meet vague external standards like the VP of engineering said we had to. 
So maybe the VP of engineering is telling you that they want automation, but you should find out from them, why do they want that automation? What are they hoping to get out of the project? Do they think that means that that's going to guarantee more quality? Do they think that means that then they'll need to hire fewer people? What are those reasons? Also, before you even start a mobile automation project, remember unit and API tests. UI automation should never be the first part of automation. That's true for web. It's even more true for mobile because unit tests are fast and reliable. Unit tests run without having to interact with the device. And API tests can quickly test all the application logic, and they're much more reliable than UI tests. So between your unit and your API tests, you can find out a lot about your mobile application without even having to connect to a device. Step two. Now that you've figured out why you want to automate, now you work with your team to determine some standards. So you and your team should talk about what does success look like? And remember, this is a conversation with your team, not on your own, because you're all going to need to be on the same page, because you're all going to need to help support this project. Once you have decided what success looks like with your team, document it somewhere, write it on a wiki page or in whatever your file sharing uh, software is to make sure that when you are in the project and you've got decisions to make, maybe you need to think about changing frameworks or maybe you need to think about changing cloud providers, whatever you're doing, you can go back to your document and say, this is what success looks like. This is why we're doing the project. So here are some ideas for success. Tests will be easy to read. Tests will be maintainable by anyone on the team. Tests will follow a set naming convention. Tests will go through the same code reviews as production code. Those four items right there are great ideas for success because it will ensure that the team can work on the project together. Another idea for success would be some kind of a pass rate, like tests will have at least a 95% pass rate. For mobile, that might be a little ambitious, but I thought I'd put it in there anyway. Once you have determined what your criteria for success are, now it's time to think about what tools to use. So first thing you need to do is you need to choose an automation framework. And what kind of automation framework you choose might depend on what kind of application you have. So I'm going to go through the different types of application and, and make some recommendations. You don't have to follow these, but this has just been what my experience has been so far. So you might have a progressive web app, which is an app that uses the same code for mobile as it does for the web. The developers write the code and it just works on the web and it just works on mobile on a web browser. And if that's the case, if you have a progressive web app, you might want to use the same tool that you're using for your web automation. For example, if your web automation is written in Cypress, you could just run the very same tests for mobile that you have already written for web. Um, you just specify with Cypress, please make sure that it's using the mobile web browser and the screen is this size. If you have a hybrid app, that's an app that can run on both iOS and Android. The developer writes the code once and it works on iOS and it works on Android. It's usually built with a cross-platform tool such as Flutter or Ionic or Xamarin. And if you have a hybrid app like this, you might want to use an automation tool such as Appium, which is basically Selenium for mobile apps, where you're writing your test code once and then that test code can run on both iOS and Android. Or you may have a native app. A native app is an app that runs on iOS or it runs on Android, but not both. You have two separate code bases. And usually for those native apps, the code is written in the framework that comes with the developer tools. So it might make sense to use the test framework that comes with the developer tools. So for Android Studio, which is where Android apps are written, you might want to use Espresso. Or if you've got an iOS application and that's written in, in 
um, Xcode and Swift, you might want to use XUI test. So once you've determined your framework, next you need to decide how are you going to run your tests. So one option would be to just run them locally on your own machine. Maybe you've got an emulator on your machine with Android Studio, for example, and you've got your test code and you just run them right there. Well, that's really easy, but that's not going to be particularly practical because uh, if you're not there in front of your computer, you have no way to run the tests. Um, another option would be to use an in-house device farm. If you are in an office and you have a whole bunch of different devices and you have employees in that office that are happy to maintain all of those devices, you could take some devices and hook them up to the automation and have the automation run on those devices. Uh, one disadvantage to that is if you don't have the people required to maintain the devices, um, you can run into problems. We actually found this at my company a couple years ago. We were using an in-house device farm, but almost all of us work remotely. So there's just a very small IT group working at the office who was maintaining the devices, but they had a whole bunch of other things to do in addition to maintaining those devices. When we left the devices plugged in all the time, the batteries would swell, then they'd stop working, then they had to order new ones. So that did not work for us. So another option is to use a cloud provider such as Sauce Labs or Browser Stack. With those providers, they are maintaining the devices for you. You pay them and then you don't need to worry about maintaining those devices. They're all ready to go. And with a company like Browser Stack that has thousands of physical mobile devices, if something goes wrong with one device, you can just quick connect to a different one because they have so many to choose from. With Sauce Labs, they have some physical devices, but they also mostly use emulators and simulators for testing. So that brings us to the next question, which is whether you want to run your tests on emulators and simulators or whether you want to run them on real devices. And there are advantages and disadvantages to each. Emulators and simulators are probably gonna be faster and there's also gonna be fewer points of failure because they're not real, they're just a simulation. Um, but you might not be able to test some of the more complicated features of your application, like interacting with a camera, for example. Um, on real devices, you can interact with the camera. You can interact with SMS or upload a file or things like that. But there also are going to be more points of failure because that, that's a real device that's connected to a real network that you are really connecting to. So you just have to think about the kinds of tests you want to run to make your choice. So now that you have figured out um, what framework you're going to use and how those tests are going to run, now it's time to create a proof of concept. Try it out and see if it works. So the proof of concept doesn't have to be done by the person who will be writing and maintaining the tests, although it could be done by that person. Um, if you're using native code, you might want to have a developer who is very familiar with the native code and maybe has written tests before. Or if you're using a tool like Appium, you might want to find somebody who's used Appium before to create that proof of concept. Whoever it is, they should write one or two tests and then hook them up end to end with the build system. But don't tie them to passing or failing the build or anything like that. Just make sure that you can trigger the tests from your build system, that the tests will run, the tests will connect to whatever device they're supposed to connect to, and they'll, they'll run and then you will return um, it, you know, the uh, information about whether the test has passed or failed. So if the, if the proof of concept is not successful, if you're running into issues or roadblocks, things that you can't solve, then go back, choose a different method, and then try again. So now we come to step four, which is to determine who will write and maintain the tests. So uh, with test writing and maintenance, the trickiest part of mobile automation is the element locators. 
Elements, we all know, can be hard to find in the web when you're doing web automation. They are even harder to find in mobile automation. They're just, they're buried in there in such a weird way and everything seems to be named the same. So you're really going to need to set specific element locators like uh, element IDs that you can interact with in order to be successful with mobile automation. So the best strategy is to have the developers set the locators while they're writing the code. When they're adding a new element to the page, they can go ahead and identify it with some kind of ID that then you can reference with the tests. It's also helpful to have the developers write the first couple of tests, especially if you're using native tools. They are familiar with the native framework. They know where everything lives. They know how to organize all of the um, classes and methods. Um, and then once the, they have done that, then it makes it a lot easier for the testers to take over the test creation and maintenance. But ideally, the whole team should be contributing to these tests because it really is, when you're with a complicated project like this, it really is a group effort. So now we come to step five, start small. So you might be tempted if now you've got a framework in place to decide, oh, I'm gonna automate everything now. But that is not usually a good idea because what you might find is if you've automated 50 tests, you might have 48 flaky tests. So it's always best to start small. So first, determine what to test. Decide on five to 10 crucial tests. These would be smoke level tests, the kind of tests where if your manager said to you, hey, we've got a new build, can you just run a couple tests on it to make sure it's okay? What, what would those tests be that you would run manually? So you want to automate those tests and only those tests to start off with. Um, and then determine which devices those tests should run on. Um, so do you want to have them run on one or two devices or just one device? Um, so you could think about what OS would you want to be interacting with? What OS version? Um, should you be running them on phone or tablet? Um, but again, start small. So if, if your user base is primarily testing on phone or using the app on their phone, and you've got um, way more iOS users than Android users, you might want to just focus on iOS phones to start off with. Or you could do, um, if you have both iOS Android and Android users, you could do maybe your the most popular version of iOS for one device and the most popular version of Android for the other device. So then it's time to run the tests nightly. Now that you've got your five to 10 tests written, you can set a nightly job to run the tests. And this will be great because if they're failing, they're not gonna interrupt anything. It doesn't matter if they take a long time to run. And then when you check the tests in the morning, you can see if they passed or failed. Monitor the tests for a few days. See which ones are flaky. You will have flaky tests. Um, and then see if you can fix the flaky ones. See if there are ways to make those tests less flaky. But also you can set retries where needed uh, because, because mobile automation requires so many connection points. You've got, um, you've got your test, you've got your build system, you've got the device, you've got the network that the device runs on, you've got whatever the test framework is that runs those tests. There are a lot of points of failure. So there are a lot of opportunities for a test to fail just because the device flaked out or because the Wi-Fi went down. Um, so it's good to set retries where you think they're needed. Um, but retries also add test time. So be careful how many retries you want to add. And then when you've got your test run, uh, passing maybe 95% of the time, maybe a little less, maybe 85, 90% of the time, it's time to integrate it into your build and deploy process. So when you first integrate it, don't fail the build when a test fails. Uh, because that's just going to result in frustrated developers. So 
set it up to have them run but not fail the build and then once those tests have proved reliable then you can set the builds to stop when a test fails and then at this point hopefully the developers understand what's being tested they understand how the tests are set up how to fix one if they've made a change that actually broke a test um, and then when we think about deployments um, you definitely want to make sure that you have the option to continue with your deployment if there are false failures. So I don't know about your company, but at my company, we often do deployments relatively late at night after hours. And so there might be one or two people who are on call for if the deployment fails, they, they come on call and they see what the problem is. Um, if, for example, you got paged because your tests were failing and then you ran the tests manually and you saw, oh, there's nothing wrong here, it must just be a flaky test, you don't want to have to cancel the deploy because then you're gonna have to reschedule the deploy. You wanna be able to say, you know what, I checked, the test is passing manually, so let's continue with the deploy. So now we come to step six, which is to grow and maintain your tests. So now you've got a small amount of tests that are running and relatively frequently passing um, 85, 95% of the time. So now you're adding more tests. And when you're adding in more tests, you need to determine when you're going to run them. So you wanna run some tests during the build process because that's good for early feedback, but the tests need to be fast. You don't wanna run your entire test suite when your developer is trying to build code because they're gonna be frustrated if it takes 15 minutes for them to run. Um, you also want to run some tests during the deploy process, but the tests need to be very reliable. And, and so this is a place where you might just want to run your smoke tests and nothing more than that. Nightly is a great time for running all of your tests. If you have 150 tests, that would be awesome to run it overnight because it's not going to interrupt anybody. The tests can take as long as they need. You can also set your tests to run at whatever other interval makes sense for you and your team. So we also have to figure out where to run the tests. So you could run your tests in the QA environment or in your staging environment or in your production environment. So the advantages of the QA environment are it's easy to have control over the environment set up, but disadvantages, it might not mirror production. But because it's the QA environment and you don't need to worry about taking it down or anything, that might be a place where you would want to run all 150 of your tests overnight. Uh, the staging environment might be closer to production, so that might be a place where you would want to run a, a subset of your tests. The production environment is going to give you the most accurate feedback because it's production, but it might be more difficult to set up because you might not have the level of permissions or, or the level of freedom to create the kinds of users that you need for your tests. Um, but then you can also run your tests in every environment as you deploy. So that would be like your smoke tests that are running in each environment as you're deploying. And then those tests serve as a quality gate that alert you if something's wrong. So for example, if you were deploying to the staging environment and you were running your deployment smoke tests and you saw that a test failed, you checked it on manually on a device and said, oh yes, there's actually something wrong here. Then you can pull back that deploy and you've just saved everybody from um, having a bug get closer to production. You also need to set aside time to maintain your tests. You probably all know that with web automation, you can't just write the tests and then forget about them and never look at them again. Um, but that's even more true with mobile because they're gonna be more flaky. So do not set them and forget them. The tests are going to need to be monitored regularly. So you would probably want to have some kind of alerting for test failures but it's very important to watch out for alert fatigue. Alert fatigue is what happens when a whole bunch of people get notified every single day about tests that are failing. Two things can happen with this. One is everyone's gonna stop paying attention to the failures. Um, if they get a message every single day, oh no, the tests are failing in production and nobody ever does anything about it, they say, oh, it's not important. And then if something goes really wrong in production, they're not gonna know. 
Um, and then another reason you want to watch for alert fatigue is if developers are seeing a message every single day about test failures day after day after day, they're going to start not trusting the tests. So for your overnight alerting for your, your tests that you're running overnight, maybe in the QA environment, which is like the full test suite, you might want to have alerting that just goes to you. So you can see what those test failures are. But then for something in production, if there's a deploy, if you're running a deployment to production and some tests have failed, you might want to be alerting a bunch of people about that. You also might want to set up a, a set time for test maintenance. Um, and then that kind of helps you remember to take a look at the tests. And it also just helps you to structure your days. So for example, in the first two days after a release, it's usually really quiet because the developers have just started working on some new things. So that's a great time to take a look at your tests, see if there's anything you want to alter or fix or add or change. Also, remember to add new tests. Probably your mobile app is getting more and more um, uh, feature rich as time goes on and as new features are added, you'll want to add in some new tests. It's a good idea to create stories for test creation to include in a sprint that does a couple of things. One, that helps the team manager see how many points are being taken on in the sprint. And two, it also serves as visibility for the work that you are doing or the work that other developers or testers on the team are doing to help maintain that test automation. And also make sure that features are stable before adding tests. A lot of times in web automation, you'll see people recommend while the developer is coding the feature, you should be creating your tests. And that's a fine idea, it helps save time. But with mobile, because mobile is so changing um, and your features might change as they're being developed, um, it's a good idea to wait for the feature to be completely stable before adding those tests. If you want to be adding some kind of testing, you could think about adding you, uh, API testing um, because you can do that before the actual elements are there on the screen. And that is all I have for you. I am looking forward to taking a look at your questions and answering your questions. Um, if you feel like taking a screenshot of this page to find out all of the different ways that you can interact with me or get more learnings from me, um, you can see my book, The Complete Software Tester, is available on Amazon um, on both Kindle and paperback. My new book, Logical Fallacies for Testers, is available on Kindle at Amazon. My YouTube show, Monday Morning Automation, you can find that at the Thinking Tester channel. Postman Essential Training is a LinkedIn learning course. Um, my blog is called Think Like a Tester, and you can find that at thinkingtester.com. And then uh, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn and on X.